you'd like to return in your Bibles to the passage that we read, in Jonah chapter 1. Then <coughs> with the Lord's help, this is the, the chapter that we'll be looking at this morning. The book of Jonah is quite an extraordinary book, isn't it? Uh, it contains only four chapters. Um, the events recorded in it are not elsewhere recorded, other than um, testified to by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, of course. And it's a story that is well known to Sunday school children up and down the land that is just the most extraordinary, uh, unique story. We know it well, don't we, how this prophet of the Lord, a true prophet of the Lord, Jonah, uh, is instructed to go to Nineveh, a great and a wicked city, a city that is described in uh, Nahum 3 and verse 1 as a bloody city, full of lies and robbery, a city where the prey departeth not, the plunder remains there. A city that um, was where Sennacherib, that great and wicked king, uh, found himself. An Assyrian city, a city that um, was a terrible, wicked city. Their wickedness is come up before me, we read in verse 2 of chapter 1. And so perhaps it's therefore understandable, at least on a human level, how Jonah uh, resisted or wanted to resist the instruction of God. As far as I'm aware, in this book... It's the only occasion in scripture where a true prophet of the Lord seeks to actively thwart the will uh, of God. But as we know, God will have his way. Uh, God will speak to the people of Nineveh and he had his way uh, with Jonah. The city of Nineveh is uh, in modern day Iraq, Mosul, and actually is a city with a great uh, amount of archaeological uh, evidence for the Bible. Uh, many of the things that are recorded about the nation of Assyria are uh, proven there, demonstrated to be true. Uh, we know the Bible is, is, is true. Uh, Archaeology uh, shows that as well. And Jonah here in chapter 1 is instructed to go, and as we know, he runs in the opposite um, direction. He goes and finds a, a ship going unto Tarshish, and it goes the opposite direction. The book of Jonah contains many great themes, doesn't it? Very many big themes that we might uh, think about perhaps this morning. We see that in this book, God works despite the stubbornness of his people and despite their disobedience. He would save Nineveh. He would save the sailors in this chapter. Despite Jonah's disobedience, God would have his way. That's an encouragement to us. We fall short, don't we? We do sin. We do disobey. We do have stubbornness within us where God will work his purposes out. We see God's providence in this book how he works his purposes out, how he brings certain situations and circumstances in order to work his purposes out. We see in this book how God saves Gentiles. We see how God is um, a God of Jew and Gentile, Jew and Greek, male and female, bond and free, how God will save the sailors here and how God will save the Ninevites. And we see that a few times, don't we, in the Old Testament and then more fully revealed in the New Testament. We see how... The Lord saves uh, Rahab in that city of Jericho. We see how the Lord saves Ruth, the Moabites, and he has his way with them. He has mercy upon their souls, and they are indeed both used in the line of Christ, as we know. The Lord saves Gentiles. That's a great encouragement to us this morning. We're not born into the uh, household of faith, as it were. We are saved in the new covenant. We are Gentile believers we see other big truths in this book. We see how God has power over creation. On several occasions in the book of Jonah, we see how the Lord Jesus, has, or the Lord God, has control and power over uh, his creation. We see in verse 4, the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. There was a mighty tempest. We see at the end of the chapter, the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow him. He had brought a fish, he'd instructed a fish, whatever sort it was, whether it was a whale, whether it was some kind of shark, who knows, it was sent to uh, swallow up Jonah. We see in chapter 4 how the Lord prepared again, there's that word again, prepared a gourd, a, 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 a plant, and he prepared it to come over Jonah, and give him a shadow over his head. And then in verse 7 of chapter 4 we read that God prepared a worm that would eat the gourd. And indeed, he prepared a mighty, uh, 
a vehement east wind we read in verse 8. And so many times we see God's power over creation. And maybe that's a truth. Maybe that's a Bible truth that we don't think about enough. How God is a creator God. How he has power over his creation. How he is a mighty God. And how the wind and the waves and the weather patterns and the, uh, all the manner of different um, weather systems work his purposes out. We see the Lord Jesus Christ in this book, uh, very clearly pictured the three days and the three nights in the belly of the fish. So the Son of Man spent three days and three nights in the heart of the, the tomb in the ground. And then he rose on the third day, the sign of Jonah. We see in this chapter the sacrifice of one to save uh, many. Again, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And chapter one, we could look at this in various different ways. We could focus in on Jonah. Uh, we could see his disobedience. But instead, what I'd like us to do this morning is to focus in on the sailors, the mariners, the heathen sailors in this chapter, and their experience here in this chapter, how they come to meet with the true God of the Bible, their encounter with the Lord God, their reaction, how Jonah tells them of the true God of heaven and earth, and how they end the chapter fearing the Lord and worshipping him. And so it, with the sailors this morning, we will see how the Lord works with people. And we ask the question whether you this morning have had a, an encounter with the Lord Jesus, with the Lord God. Has he spoken to you? Is he speaking to you? And how have you responded? And these are some of the questions to have in your heart. This book here is not an allegory or a fable. It is truth. This is historical fact. This really happened. And God has lessons for us even thousands of years um, later. I'm going to take the position that these sailors, these mariners, were truly saved this morning. I think that's a reasonable position to hold based on the scriptures that we have uh, before us, that they were truly saved by the events that happened here. And for our uh, thoughts this morning, we have uh, four uh, headings, four stages, if you like, of their encounter with God. The first is, is that, that they have an encounter. They have an encounter with the true God. In verse 4 we read, The Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. These mariners, uh, likely uh, Phoenician mariners, experienced uh, tradesmen on the seas, experienced uh, sailors, they experienced a storm and a tempest like nothing that they had experienced before. Similarly to the disciples that we mentioned with the children. This storm was different. There was something supernatural about this storm. It was a storm the like they had never seen before. There was something supernatural about it. They encountered the power and the might of the Lord God. Perhaps for the first time in their lives. Their consciences were pricked. They were afraid, we read in verse 5. And they cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship. They were likely uh, polytheistic uh, believers in false gods. If they were Phoenicians, then they had many gods. And they uh, try every god they can think of here. They worship uh, Baal, no doubt. And other gods as well. Perhaps they had a god of the sea that they sought to worship also. As we know, these were false gods. These were fake gods. They couldn't help at all. The, sh the storm wasn't um, assuaged by their praying to these false gods. They try and lighten the load themselves. They cast their wares into the sea. They try and lighten the load of the ship. Perhaps that will stem the tide. Perhaps that will stop the ship from breaking up. But as we know, it doesn't work either. This storm is of God. It cannot be overcome with their own uh, solutions. And there's a challenge here for us, isn't there? Uh, how we might turn to our own solutions uh, to seek to uh, assuage our conscience, seek to um, avert the crisis of sin that is in our hearts. And men and women, boys and girls across the world turn to all manner of different solutions. They have an encounter with the Lord God, and yet they run from him. They run to false gods. They run to their own good works. They hear about their need of a saviour, 
And they don't like what they hear. They don't like the fact that they need to come to an end of themselves. They don't like the fact that they need to, um, to humbly come and lay all before the cross of Calvary. And so they turn to false gods. And across the world today there are thousands of false gods that are worshipped. Violating the commandments of God. And men and women, boys and girls try their own solutions, don't they? To ease the conscience, ease their consciences. They give great sums of money to charity. They perform great acts of service. All to try and lighten the load, as it were, of their guilt of sin. To try and make themselves feel better. They try and dabble with spirituality. They book themselves spiritual retreats. They try to get in touch with their spiritual side. They perhaps visit uh, members of the occult and all these wicked, um, wicked individuals. They try their own methods and means. But as we know from God's word, they're fruitless. They're pointless. And if you this morning are seeking to, uh, to allay your conscience by good works, by uh, prayers to a false god, it will not work. The storm is still there. God is still speaking to you even uh, this morning. They encourage Jonah to pray to his God as well, don't they? In verse 6, the shipmaster comes to him and says, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us, that we perish not. They, they try every God they can think of. Perhaps that uh, Jonah who's asleep in the ship, perhaps his God can help us. Go and try his God. And so the shipmaster comes and asks him to pray upon his uh, God too. They are superstitious. They uh, cast lots to find who, uh, for whose cause this evil is upon us. And perhaps we don't criticise them too heavily on this point. As we know in the Old Testament, lots were cast and God used the casting of lots to show his will. And he does so here too, doesn't he? We, re we remember how the tribes, the land in the land of Canaan was distributed through the casting of lots. The Lord Jesus, uh, the Lord God does use in the Old Testament the casting of lots to, to show his will. But we don't do that today. We don't cast lots or roll a dice or um, practice superstitious practices. We have the full canon of God's word. We have the full and entire revealed will of God. And it is perfect that the man of God may be Thoroughly furnished, perfect, that we may be, uh, know the will of God, that we may know his attributes, that we may know his will. And so we don't cast lots, we don't take part in superstition. The lot falls upon Jonah. In God's providence it falls upon him. He is shown to be the reason for this uh, great storm. Well we've said, have you had a true encounter with the Lord God? Is the Lord God speaking to your heart even this morning? His, is he knocking at the door of your heart? His voice is thunderous at times. His voice is powerful at times. The word of God is powerful word. I preached a sermon rec recently from Ezekiel 43. And in Ezekiel 43 and verse 2, we read that the vo the, the the voice of God was like a noise of many waters. It's a powerful voice. The word of God is powerful. You might think there of the wind and the waves, a storm upon the sea. You might think perhaps of a waterfall. And perhaps you've been to one of the great waterfalls in the world, Niagara Falls or Victoria Falls, wherever it might be. And you can't speak to the person next to you. Such is the noise of the water. Such is the power of the water. And sometimes that is how God's word hits us. It is powerful. It is a powerful word. It tells us that we are sinners. It tells us that we have fallen short of his glory. His word tells us that we have a need of a saviour. It is a powerful word. It is as a storm upon us. It rocks us. It shakes us to our very core. Perhaps you think of um, water in a different sense. Water in a manufacturing process. It's it's fired with such force at metal or whatever object that it can cut. It is, it is able to cut. And God's word is sometimes a cutting. It is sharp. It's like a sword. It pierces us. It is sharp. It is powerful. It is mighty. 
And we ask the question, what is God saying to you today? Have you ever come to him? Have you ever confessed your sin? Have you ever acknowledged that you need a saviour? Perhaps you have been putting off something that the Lord has been speaking to you about for some time. Perhaps the Lord has laid on your heart some work for him and you've been putting it off. Uh, yet his word is sharp. It is powerful. Do not uh, put aside the word of God if it is speaking to you. The word of God tells us of sin and a wrath to come. It is a powerful word. It tells us uh, without beating around the bush and honestly and openly about the judgment of God that he is a consuming fire. That he is angry with the wicked every day. And we must turn to him and be saved. Let us not try human means of escape. Let us not try and placate our consciences with good works and charitable service and all manner of other things. Let us hear what the word of God is saying to us even this morning. Well, secondly, how do, uh, what happens next? Well, they hear a gospel witness for the first time. They encounter the Lord God, perhaps for the first time. A supernatural storm. And next they hear a gospel witness for the first time. In verse um, 6 onwards we read, What meanest thou, O sleeper? In verse 7, They said every one to his fellow, Come, let us cast lots, and it falls upon Jonah. Verse 8, Tell us, we pray thee, whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? What is thy country? Of what people art thou? And he said unto them, and here is the confession. Here is the gospel witness. I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Jonah is honest here. He is a good prophet here. He is obedient. He confesses who he is. He is honest with them. I am a Hebrew. I am from the people of God. I am from the chosen people. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven which hath made the sea and the dry land. He who has made these seas, these seas that are so fearsome, that are so tempestuous. I fear the God, I know the God who has made the sea. He who is in heaven. Jonah demonstrates here that he does fear the Lord God. We have an insight into his soul. He acknowledges that the storm is from God himself. This God is different to their gods. This God, the Jehovah, the true God, he is the God who created heavens and earth. He is not a God of bronze or of brass, of iron, of wood, of gold. He is not a God that is inanimate, that can't be known. He is a God that can be known. A God that is to be worshipped. A God that is to be feared. Jonah, even in his disobedience, is obedient here and testifies of the true God. You know, when challenged, do we as believers, do we testify of the true God? When we are challenged in our workplaces, when we are challenged in our family lives, when we are challenged at home with our neighbours, with our friends, do we give a true report? Do we give an honest report? Do we say, I fear the Lord God of heaven? I fear him who is the true God. When we're invited to go to some place that we don't want to be associated with, when our family ask us to do something or partake in something that we ought not, when our friends try to encourage us to go here, to do that, to do the other, do we say, I am of the Lord's people, I believe the Bible, I fear God, I seek to obey the Ten Commandments, I seek to obey Him, or do we not? Do we not give a true report? Are we ashamed of our Saviour? Are we ashamed of the true God? Do we stifle our faith? It is difficult. It is difficult to be honest sometimes, isn't it? It can create the scorn of others. But that's what the Bible tells us. It, whilst we're in the world, we should expect persecution. We should expect the scorn of the world. Jonah is honest here. I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord. They hear a gospel witness for the first time. I don't know everyone here this morning. I don't know if this is the first gospel message that you've heard. You may have heard the gospel message many times. Perhaps this morning would be the first time that you would really hear it. You wouldn't just hear it with your ears and it would go out the other, uh, go out the, uh, your mind. Perhaps you would take it to heart 
and trust in the Lord Jesus for salvation. The third stage in their experience. How do they respond to this gospel witness? What do they do? They cry out for a solution, don't they? Verse 10, they were exceedingly afraid. They said unto him, why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then, they, then said they unto him in verse 11, what shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was te tempestuous. What may, shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? In other words, what must we do to be saved? How can we be saved? They are facing peril. They don't deny it. They don't deny their peril. They know they need a solution. What must we do to be saved? In the same words as the Philippian jailer. They ask Jonah why he has done this. Perhaps they are um, making an, an inquiry. Why have you ran away from the Lord God? Perhaps they are rebuking him. Why have you done this? Why have you angered the Lord God who is God of heaven, sea and land? What must we do? To be saved. This is the right and proper response to an encounter with the Lord God. When he is speaking to you, you ask, what must we do to be saved? What must we do to obey the Lord God? They don't deny their need. Of course they don't. They know they have a need. They see the danger round about them. We must, deny, we must not deny our need either. We must not deny our first need, the need of salvation, the need of saving from our sins we must not deny our ongoing needs the needs that we need him every day we need him every hour we need him to strengthen us to comfort us and to sanctify us we don't deny our need and neither did they and finally how did they then respond to this message what was their final stage of their conversion experienced well they hear the instruction to cast him into the sea he says in verse 12, take me up, cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. He tells them to cast him into the sea and obviously they're, they're, they're fearful of that. They're fearful of shedding innocent blood. They're fearful, in, fearful of committing murder as far as they're concerned. It's a certain death for this sailor, casting him overboard. And so initially they try their own solutions again. In verse 13, nevertheless the men rowed hard to bring it to the land, but they could not. They seek to row again and return to land. They hear what must be done and they resist initially. They seek to row back to land. Are you resisting the gospel message this morning? Have you heard what it is to be a Christian? To forsake all, to daily take up your cross and follow him, to deny yourself. And to trust in him, to confess all your sin, to lay it all before him. And initially at least, you're resisting. You're saying, no, that's, I don't want that. That would require me to give up this. That would require me to give up that. I'm going to try my own way again first. The sailors, they give up. They could not, we read. And indeed, we cannot earn our salvation. Salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. We cannot row our way to heaven, as it were. In the same way that they sought to row back to land. Our own solutions will not work. We must hear the word of God and obey. Repent and be baptised. And you think, I can't be baptised. I can't take that step of obedience. It would cause shame in my family. Well, we know salvation is not through our baptism. But we should obey. We should be obedient. Maybe the Lord is telling you to be baptised, perhaps even this morning. And you're resisting. You're saying, no, I can't. The Lord says, repent and be baptised. And we must obey him. And so finally they come and they say a prayer. They pray unto the Lord. They cry unto the Lord in verse 14. We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. Let us not perish for this man's life. Lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah, cast him forth into the sea. The sea ceased from her raging and in verse 16, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. They come. There was that irresistible grace there. As, lo as, as much as they tried initially to resist, they couldn't resist. It wasn't good enough. There was irresistible grace. It, it drew them in. They trusted in the Lord God. They worshipped him. They had great fear. They feared the Lord 
exceedingly. We know in the Bible how the fear of the Lord describes that reverential fear of God, acknowledging that he is a God of justice and a God of judgment, and he is a God to be feared, to be venerated, to be revered. For a Christian, the fear of God is not a, a fear of his judgment, because that has been conquered for us. The fear of God is a, a reverence for his might, his power, his awe. The fear of God for an unbeliever is indeed of his justice and his judgment. The fear of hell, the fear of condemnation. They feared God exceedingly and they offer a sacrifice unto the Lord. They shed blood, picturing, as we know, those sacrifices, picturing the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they make vows. What these vows were, we don't know. Did they vow never to return to these false gods ever again? Did they vow to commit their lives unto the Lord and be followers of him? They make vows. And we as believers, when we turn to the Lord, we make a vow. We, we say, Lord, I will follow you all the days of my life. Though the road may be rough and steep, though the road may be difficult, though the storms of life may come upon us, yet, Lord, I will look unto you, who is the author and finisher, you who has begun a good work in me will finish it, will complete it. And so, Lord, I will follow you. They offer a sacrifice unto the Lord. They fear him, they worship him. And indeed, every believer that is saved, that is saved from the storms of life, from the storms of death, we must worship the Lord. We are here today on the Lord's Day to worship him, to return thanks unto him that, is, that has sent his son to be the saviour of the world. We must worship him as a church, corporately. We must worship him as individuals every day. We must daily come and confess our sins and daily plead upon the blood of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. The sailors, they see something here of the substitutionary atonement. They cast Jonah into the sea. And his, that sacrifice, as it were, is the means of their salvation from the storm. It's a picture, isn't it, of Christ he who gave his life for many. Jonah brought the storm upon himself and upon the sailors. It was his sinful act that brought it upon, upon them. But as we know, the Lord Jesus did not sin. He fulfilled the law perfectly. He didn't fall in any point. And yet he gave his life for many. For me and for you. The substitutionary atonement. That there at the cross of Calvary, the just was in the place of the unjust. The righteous was in the place in the place of the unright unrighteous. And so as we come to a conclusion here, we see the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. We see he who gave his life for many, not for his friends, but for his enemies, for those that have sinned against him, for those that have violated his law. He gave up his life willingly for them. Sin is defeated. The storm of death is conquered. And as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, Death has lost its sting. There is no more sting. There is no more sin to fear. Heaven is a perfect place. A place where sin will not spoil and ruin and taint. Sin is conquered and sin is vanquished. And so as we come to a conclusion then, as we draw these thoughts together, we see from Jonah chapter 1 how despite Jonah's disobedience, God would have his purposes. God would work his purposes out. And he would save these mariners. They had an encounter with God, perhaps the first in their lives. And by the end of this encounter, they submit and they worship. And that is our response that we should each follow this morning too. May we worship the God of heaven, the God who made the sea, the God who made the land, the God who has sent his son to be the saviour of the world. May God bless his word to us. Amen. <laughs>